the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine. All righty, we're going to get started. Thank you all for hanging in there for the downhill slide. It's going to be hard to um, match Dr. Koch. She was outside worried that she wasn't going to keep people awake. I said, oh my God. Dr. Blodgett kept saying, does she like take medication? I said, oh, yeah. so. She's just hyped up about this whole thing. Uh, I'm Barbara Walls. I'm a registered nurse and certified diabetes educator. I'm the diabetes education program coordinator for the Vision 17. Now I'm based here out of um, Audi and I, my office is over across from the rec hall by IMC. Rachel Barkey, she's over at TDI, uh, TDI Frank Tejeda. So she does educate, raise your hand. She does education at Frank Tejeda. And Frank Tejeda, where else? South Bear? Balcony Science and South Bear. Okay, Balcony Science and South Bear. Um, we can either, if you have patients that you see, you can either refer them to Rachel or you can refer them to me. You can either send a consult or if you just want to put me as a co-signer, that's fine. I don't, or just send them. I don't care. I just want to get a hold of the patients so I can teach them what to do because they are just clueless, absolutely clueless. And that's part of this whole thing is about, did I go the wrong way? Oh, people are clueless. They're, they're clueless about what they eat. You know, as they mentioned several times, this is all about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates raise your blood sugar. People with diabetes have no clue what carbohydrates are. The, just, just before I came, when I broke at lunchtime, some lady came in to tell me her husband was in the nursing home, the, the one in Floresville, and the nurses weren't doing it right, that his blood sugars were way high all the time. Like yesterday, I said, she goes, she says, you know, I, I know it's about carbohydrates. I said, we recommend 45 grams of carbs per meal, 45. That's three 15 gram servings. And so a serving is about what you can hold in your hand. So I was telling her that. She goes, well, you know, they gave him a hamburger. I said, that's two. And french fries. I said, that's three servings of carbs. I can, I can deal with that. She goes, well, last night, though, his blood sugar was over 400. I said, so what do you have for lunch? Well, they took him out for Mexican food. He had an enchilada, a taco, a tamale, rice, beans, and chips. Oh, and, I, and I do this. Because, okay. <laughs> so now he had nine servings of carbs. And you're complaining because the nursing home gives him three servings. Well, his sugar was 400. I said, because you gave him nine servings of carbs. <laughs> she couldn't quite seem to get that across. But again, they're just clueless. Now, okay. now some things I've heard. Now, when you're talking to patients, all that stuff that the doctor said are great. But somebody's got to get the patient to do it. And that's where we fall in. And that's why I spend a lot of my time doing it. I feel very fortunate that I get to spend a good six hours with the patients. We have a class, it's a six hour class. When the patients, when I call them to say, you know, you need to come to the class, they go, six hours, what are they going to discuss for six hours? I said, they'll be surprised. Yeah. Just come, if you get bored at any time, feel free to get up and leave. I, I will not tie you in the chair. Most of the time when we're done, they're going, that's all? Don't we get more? I said, no, no, we're done. You're, you're leaving now. It's 2.30. Please go. If you have questions, call me. But again, I, there's a few things I've learned because I get to spend a long time with them. Some of the guys will come in and they'll bring in Danish with them. And so when I go by and say, did you eat breakfast? And they'll go, no, didn't eat breakfast. I said, you've got a Danish under your chair. We all sat and watched you eat it. Oh, that's not breakfast. That was just a little snack. So when you talk to them, you have to make sure you ask them, do you put anything in your mouth between 7 and 12? Because they don't consider sodas. They, several of them have two or three sodas in the morning, and they don't consider that breakfast. So if you ask, do you eat breakfast, they will say no. So, but then you want to say, why the heck is your blood sugar 300 or 400 or 500? So again, you have to ask, what did you put in your mouth? The other thing, uh, again, have you had anything to eat or drink since you woke up this morning? Also, when you ask what they eat for breakfast, they will say, oh, eggs, sausage, biscuits. Uh, again, had a gentleman not too long ago who went to see Dr. Blodgett, and he told her, eggs, sausage, and biscuits. Went to see the dietitian, eggs, sausage, and biscuits. And so he got to me, I said, did you eat here? And he goes, yeah. I said, so you had gravy on your biscuits. He goes, no one ever asked me that. How did you know? I said, because I stand in that line and every single person orders biscuits, that little lady will say, you want gravy on Mr. Biscuit? Right? She says that to everybody. Yep. And so, and 99.9% .9 of the guys go, yeah, throw some gravy on. Well, that's another serving of fat and carbs. So that's something important. So again, just to clarify that, to, you'll be aware of their, their 
uh, situation and where they're, where, where they're being and stuff, so you can kind of get the right information from them. Sodas are a beverage of choice in South Texas. Um, they have approximately one packet of sugar per ounce. This 12 ounce soda has 12 packets of sugar. Most people have no clue. And I tape it on there so they'll see this. If you would like one, let me know. My office is right across from the rec room. I have some of these I will give you. And just having to sit on the desk, they'll say, so what's that? I said, that's how much sugar is in a regular soda. And they go, oh my gosh, I had no clue. Now that's a 12 ounce soda. Those who are doing 32 ounce sodas, 32 packets of sugar. Now one gentleman pointed out the other day, there's ice in it. Okay, good. Now there's 16 packets of sugar. <laughs> I don't care, you cannot drink regular sodas. The dietitians go over and over with them that you know you, you can eat anything you want. That's true, you can eat anything, but you cannot drink anything you want. Because this is your entire allotment for that meal. So again, be very careful with the, with the so regular sodas. Also, sweet teas. All the different companies put lots and lots of sugar in their tea. Bill Miller sweet tea, the Malt House sweet tea, Bill Rosa sweet tea, Bush's sweet tea. Bush's chicken sweet tea. Another advantage of being sitting in the class with them is when I ask them, do you go out to eat? Oh, no, no, we never go out to eat. Well, then they start talking. I hear, oh, did you hear about that new bush? There's a new bush is over and such. I said, thought you didn't go out to eat. Oh, well, not very often. But well, they still do it. And so, you know, they go to Bush's one day, then they go to McDonald's the next day, then they go to Bill Miller's one day. So by the end of the week, they've eaten out, eaten out every single night, but they don't, somehow that doesn't register. Now, Dr. Blodgett and I have had a number of conversations. She thinks they lie. I don't think they lie. I just think they kind of misread the truth. They just kind of don't, you know, somehow it just doesn't, doesn't, I don't know what it is. But they will sit there and tell me with a very honest face, I don't drink sodas. And I'll see them in the hallway with one. And I said, I thought you didn't drink sodas. Oh, well, not very often. You still drink sodas? You ask me, I never, never, ever drink sodas. I would be pretty close to dead. Um, so again, assessing how many sodas do you drink? So just ask them, so, so how many do you do? Three, four, five a day? Uh, the other thing is, if they've been drinking sodas and they stop, if they're on insulin at bedtime, they're going to have to stop their insulin or cut back a lot. Because a lot of the patients are taking insulin because of the sodas they drink. One of these sodas will probably be a good 10 units of insulin. So if they've been drinking two a day and they keep, and they keep taking the same dose of insulin and they stop this, then they're going to either have to, then they're going to have to low sugar and they drink sodas again anyway. So again, uh, again, just have a, oh, the other thing is that, um, a lot of times when patients say, well, I can't drink the diet sodas, there's too many chemicals. If you saw, the other day I saw in the newspaper, Sweet and Low has been around since 1887. I am pretty sure that in the last 150 years, if there was a problem with Sweet and Low, the, the uh, FDA would have figured that out. So again, when they look at the studies and they say that the, the little rats that drank diet sodas ended up with bladder cancer, that was a little rats that drank like 320 sodas a day. The odds of them getting bladder cancer from 300 sodas a day is very low. The odds of them losing their eyes or kidneys or their legs from two or three of these sodas a day is very high. The other thing is that when you, uh, they, there was a recent study, just recently, there's that thing about the people who drink diet sodas gain more weight. They're, they're, get, they're, 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 they have bigger waistlines as they get older. If you look at the study, they actually called people. This was, this was a self report Hi, Mrs. Smith. Um, do you drink diet sodas? Well, yes, I do. Have you gained weight in the last five years? Well, yes, I have. There you go. Diet sodas <laughs> cause weight gain. If you thought to think of it, thin people don't drink diet sodas. People are overweight in first, but they drink diet sodas. The other thing, and this is just, again, this is, there's no scientific on this. This is my observation. I tend to observe things. Is that when you go out with people and the lady comes around and takes the, the drink order and somebody says they want a diet soda, I can bet you when the dessert people come around, they're the first one to order dessert. <laughs> because they think, well, I had a diet soda, it's okay. So again, so there's a trade-off there, and they didn't ask about, are you eating you know, desserts? And that's one of the things I found among the older people. Older people have dessert quite often. I never had dessert. I've already figured out I cannot eat dessert. But older people, it's not a big deal for them to have a piece of pie at night, or a couple of brownies, or a couple of cookies or something, as a holdover from the days when they were younger and much more active. So that's the first thing. If you can cut out the sodas and the, and the desserts, you can make big impacts with that. Okay. Sweet tea, I already mentioned that. Make sure you ask about it. Uh, there's about 208 to 400 calories per cup, and that's per calorie king, per serving. Sports drinks, somehow these, these and I, and I, our older men think that you have to replace your electrolytes. 
And I found that's only if you've done something to lose your electrolytes. <laughs> you know, if you're not doing anything, there's no need to do that. Well, they mowed a quarter acre of grass yesterday with the with the riding lawnmower. I said, right. no, I'm sorry, that just doesn't count. You have to you have to do something. Again, because on TV it says it's good for you, so they all think they have to chug it. But that thing of Gatorade, that's supposed to be for four people. And so that will raise your share probably about 200 points. So again, this whole thing about electrolytes, they get totally confused with that. So, and it, mo most of our patients are not working hard enough to justify drinking sports drinks or, or uh, what's that, uh, electrolyte replacement things. Because they don't do anything. That's the whole reason they have diabetes. You know, if they're out working out, they could have some of this stuff there. Okay. Energy drinks, be careful with that too. Again, uh, a lot of the younger ones, we're seeing patients younger and younger with diabetes now. Um, I don't know about y'all, but back when I was in school, the old guys got diabetes. Diabetes was an old people disease. People over 65 got diabetes. Then about 15, 20 years ago, it moved down into the Vietnam era. So the guys in their 45 and 50 were getting diabetes. Now we've got them coming in 25, 28, 30 years old with type 2 diabetes. And again, it's based on the, the bad eating habits they have and, and chugging these energy drinks and the um, like Gatorades and stuff. So just be aware that they need to be able to read the labels on this. Now, meal replacements. I don't know how many times patients have said, well, look on here. It says if I drink this, it controls my glucose. This is not in addition to your pancakes and syrup. Um, this, is, this is a meal, a meal replacement, not a meal enhancement. And there's a couple of the patient, guys who work here that I know who they are. They've been through class. When I walk through the cafeteria, I see them sitting there with their pancakes and syrup and eggs and whatever else, drinking a boost. I said, so why do you do that? Well, yeah, see, it says, controls your glucose. So we have to have a little conversation again. <laughs> we need to be aware of that. Uh, the other thing now, again, if they're very thin, but if you're 300 pounds, you don't need to be drinking this on a, in addition to that. And there's a couple of them who, uh, I've seen several older people just recently that we're shipping this to them, and I guess at some point, somewhere, they said they couldn't eat. But again, I just don't think you weigh 300 pounds and can't eat. Something, something's not working right. So again, just be, just make sure that you ask about this kind of stuff. Especially if they have occasional spikes in their sugar, it might be when they decide they didn't like dinner and had three or four of these instead. Um, fruit is good for you, okay. When you're looking at carbs, there's three, three all food falls in one of three categories. Carbohydrates, proteins, or fats. Carbohydrates raise your blood sugar. All the carbs raise your blood sugar. So when you're looking at labels, you're looking at carbohydrates, not sugars, but carbohydrates. Under carbohydrates, there's three kinds of carbohydrates. The sucrose, fructose, and lactose. Sucrose is all your grains, cereals, pastas, rice, corn. They're all going to raise your blood sugars. There's some kind of a some kind of a thing going around saying that don't eat the white bread. Brown bread's good for you. All the bread's going to raise your sugar. Doesn't matter if it's white, brown, whatever. Don't don't waste money on sugar-free. That's not the, it's not the sugar. It's the fact that it's made out of grain. The same thing with sugar-free cookies. Be very careful things that say sugar-free on them. These sugar-free cookies, four cookies have 22 grams of carbs. If you remember the rule of 15, every 15 grams of carbs raise your blood sugar 50 points. Remember when your sugar's low, rule of 15? Same thing holds true for just in general. So if they have four of these cookies, it's going to raise your sugar about 75 points. Now, usually what happens when I ask the guys about it, they go, oh, no, it says sugar-free on it, but, you know, they're not very good. So you know, I end up eating quite a few. And so when they want just a little something sweet after dinner, and they have like two or three, they're going to eat the whole sleeve because it just doesn't satisfy that whatever it is they're looking for. Surprisingly, if you look at Triple Delight Oreos, one cookie, which is three cookies with icing, is 15 grams of carbs. So I typically tell if you want to have a cookie, just have a good cookie. Have a good one. Yes, one. One good cookie and get over with. Because if you look at the mother's, the regular mother's oatmeal with icing on top, it still has 22 grams of carbs for four cookies. So all, that ratio is the same for everything. Four for 22, three for 15, it's all the same. So again, sugar-free is not actually always the best choice. Maybe when it comes to ice cream, if, they, if, they, if they're not going to give out their ice cream, at least switch from regular ice cream to sugar-free ice cream. Sodas, they can do sugar-free, but cookies and candies and stuff really don't matter. It still has, the, the fact that it's made out of flour, wheat, corn, rice, it's still going to raise your sugar, okay? The next thing is the fruits. Somehow the fruit people have done a really good job of marketing that teaches fruit is good for us. The more the better. The first thing is all this orange juice, lots and lots of juice. The current literature. Excuse me. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. We're having difficulty hearing you. Okay. I'm sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Must have been. She said 
Yes. yes. Okay. The mic there too. Yeah, the other thing is with the juices. It doesn't matter if it's orange juice, apple juice, grape juice. The, the current literature says juice is medicinal for people with diabetes. If you have a patient who, who takes insulin, has a low sugar, what are they supposed to do? Drink juice. This much juice will raise your sugar 50 points within five minutes. So when they're chugging down those big old glasses of orange juice over at, pain, uh, at what's that pain, uh, IHOP and stuff, they're just jacking their sugars through the roof. So that's a very hard concept for a lot of people to get because they think, well, juice is fruit. That's they say eat more fruit. If you think about the old adage, it was an apple a day, <laughs> not four or five servings. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I saw it. half a cup. Yeah, half a cup of juice. So what we prefer they do because this glass of juice, gunk, gunk, it's down, and their sugar's up 15 points, 50 points, excuse me, 50 points. We prefer they have a piece of fruit. Again, it's about this much. This is a serving size. An apple, an orange, a peach, a pear, a plum, a banana. Half a banana is worth 15 grams. Do you know how many of these guys eat three or four bananas every night before they go to bed? And they wonder why their blood is 300 the next morning? But again, I think they just, they just don't know. They, they honestly, honestly act very surprised when I tell them. The other thing is grapes. These are little sugar shots. And people think, no, the other day when I had in class, I had this conversation with a man about his blood sugar being three. And when I told him this, he goes, oh, honey, I ate the whole tree last night. <laughs> that's probably why your blood sugar is 300 this morning. So that much rate This is a serving. One hand, this is 15 grams. It's about a handful. Mm -hmm. So when they have a little bowl of grapes on the kitchen table, and every time they go by, they grab a handful. 50 points, 50 points, 50 points, 50 points. Their sugar will never go down. And again, the only, remember Dr. Copes and Dr. Blodgett both said, the only way these carbohydrates get into your system is insulin. If you're insulin dependent and you're just chomping on fruit whenever, if you don't have a rapid acting insulin to work on it, there's no place for it to go other than to stay in the bloodstream circulating around, and that's what clogs up your kidneys and stuff. It's not the fact that there's sugar in the urine, it's the sugar that's in the bloodstream that's, that's clogging it up. Okay. Um, one, the other thing I want to mention, let's, let's go back one, back, back to, the, to the grains and cereals. Cereals are really bad. Uh, not, a, lot, a lot of people tell me, oh, I never eat supper. I just have a little bowl of Cheerios before I go to bed. This is not a bowl of Cheerios. This is a cereal bowl. <laughs> so for those guys who are having, or girls, having just a little bowl of Cheerios with a banana on top before they go to bed, that's why their sugar is 300, and that's why they're taking 30, 40, 50 units of insulin before they go to bed at night. So if they stop this, they need to be careful because then they'll start having low sugars. Then they'll wake up, then in the middle of the night, they'll get up and drink a soda anyway. So again, uh, Dr. Blodgett said to get them engaged. I think we also need to empower them to, to be aware of how these foods are affecting their blood sugars and what kind of medicine they need to, t to take with it. Okay, so back to the fruits. Uh, bananas and grapes tend to be men's favorite because they're the highest in sugar, very high in uh, carbohydrates. Uh, or, all the juices, orange juice, grape juice, apple juice, should be reserved to treat hypoglycemia. Now that you know that a half a cup is 15 grams, how many grams of carbs do you think might be in this? Uh, what is it? Grape juice. Oh, wow. Um, 53 grams of carbs. Yeah. 53. And if we recommend 45 per meal, if you look at this Butterfinger, this has 42 grams of carbs. There's more sugar in that thing of grape juice than there is in the Butterfinger. Not that I'm trying to pay to be eat Butterfingers, but I see all the time when they tell their little grandchildren, oh no, Miha, not that. Have this, because this is a lot better for you. <laughs> so again, just be, fruit is real, and juices are really, really high. Um, one other thing, I've had a lot of conversations, my son's really into fitness stuff, and we were talking about the paleo diet. They said, eat like a caveman. And we came up with this, you don't have to eat like a caveman, just eat like your grandparents did. Because if you're from the San Antonio or South Texas area, there was no HEB 100 years ago. And so if you didn't have apple trees in your backyard, you probably didn't eat a lot of apples. If you didn't have a banana tree, you didn't eat a lot of bananas. So just think along the lines of how your grandparents and wherever your people are from and how, what made them flourish. Because we're all here because our grandparents were good at eating whatever it was they had and working very hard to get it. Because, you know, most people, didn't, most people they did a lot more heavy labor than we do nowadays. Um, the, the whole thing about whole wheat bread is good for you, popcorn is good for you. They might be better choices, but they still raise the blood sugar. Milk, again, I see people drinking lots and lots of milk. I had a gentleman, Mr. Rankin, this has been about six or eight months ago. He, when I was talking about the whole milk thing, he was drinking a half a gallon of milk a day. Wow, and I said, why do you do that? He goes, 
So, are you saying there's calories in milk? I said, yes, sir, there's still sugar. <laughs> sure. But milk, no. milk's good for you, right? I said, there's still sugar in it. And it doesn't matter if it's fat-free, 1%, 2%, whole milk, it has the same sugar content. That's the fat content, but not the sugar. So he said he didn't realize there was sugar. So we had this conversation. I said, well, how much do you drink? A half a gallon a day. I said, why do you do that? He goes, well, my grandma told me it was good for me. I said, when you were really like 14? He goes, yeah. I must have been about 14. I was pretty puny back then. I said, well, you fixed that. <laughs> and so he stopped the milk. And Oscar Guinness lost 35 pounds. He said for the first month, he said he dropped 15 pounds just like that. He said, I honestly thought I had cancer. I thought something was wrong with me because the weight was just falling off. And he said, and then it slowed down, slowed down. And, he said, and people were saying, gee, you look really good. And he's, he said, then he realized that he felt so much better. And he made an interesting comment that you never know how bad you feel until you start feeling better. That's right. He said he felt bad for so long, he just thought that was natural. He says he actually went out and got another job. He was 55 years old. He says, I don't know how people ever work till 65 because I'm dragging myself out of bed every day. He said, I could barely move. But after those 35 pounds, he began off his diabetes medicines, his hypertension medicines, and his lipid medicines. Should come with everything. Yes. How much milk uh, is it? Uh, half a cup? 15 one cup. One cup. One cup. Yeah. Okay. Eight ounces. You know, so just be aware again, this is very common for people to drink lots of milk. Uh, Sugar-free foods, we kind of talked about that. Just be, make sure that you uh, look at the labeling. Uh, that sugar-free does not mean there's not honey, molasses, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. You know, on the um, Mrs. Butterworth pancake syrup, it says sugar-free on it. It says 27 grams of carbs because the second degree is high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> oh, my God. So just be aware that um, you need to oh read the labels. If, if, if you don't feel comfortable, you'll make sure all your patients get to see a, a dietitian, because the dietitian go with, with them, how to interpret the labels, how to read them, what, the, what they're meaning. So. What about that oh. agave? Same thing. Same. Agave, agave, honey. They're all, and a lot of people say, well, honey's good for you. I didn't yeah. think agave was good. It's, it's the same. Thing. It still has sugar in it. It's, it's a carbohydrate. Okay. Right, Lisa? <laughs> yes, she's our chief dietitian. <laughs> okay, uh, vegetables. Vegetables, they can have all they want. With about this point where I'm saying, well, you have to be careful with all of your bread, cereals, pasta, rice, corn, your fruits, your milk. They go, well, what am I supposed to eat? Well, they can eat lots of vegetables. I don't care if they can have all the green beans, broccoli, cabbage, coleslaw, cucumbers, tomatoes, onions, peppers, asparagus, green beans, um, squash, they want. Because they're going to have to eat a lot before it makes their blood sugar go up. But that does not include corn, macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes, french fries, peas, or fritos. And again, some people will tell you when you ask them what vegetables do they eat, it's these right here. That's their favorite vegetables. Now, okay, so that, that's the food. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. So, we, we, I talk to them for two hours, the dietitian talks for two hours, right before the patients leave for, class, for lunch at, at noon. I usually go over a little thing with them and say, okay, let's say that you're going to go to the cafeteria and you're going to order a, 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 a hamburger. You have your bun. You put meat on it. You put mayonnaise on it. You put cheese on it. Lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, onions. How many servings of carbohydrate is that? Very good. You know what answers I get? A lot. At least 25, 25 <laughs> servings. There's not even 25 items. <laughs> but they still don't get it. Because then I said, S tell me the carbs. The cheese. Yeah, cheese is not a carb. No. This is fat. This is 100 calories worth of fat. Mayonnaise. No. This is 100 calories worth of mayonnaise. Do you know how many calories it takes to make a pound? About 3,500. About 3,500. If you want to lose weight, you need to cut out about 500 calories a day. 500 calories a day will make a pound a week which means by the first of summer, you would be 10 pounds lighter. This is 100 calories. This is 100 calories. A flour tortilla has 100 calories more than a corn tortilla. So what we talk about in class is you don't have to start, just make better choices. You can still have a hamburger, but you can just still put cheese and mayonnaise on it. Put mustard instead, and you can still put all the other stuff. And again, then this, will, this is 30 grams of carbs. Now, um, I think that's all medicine. Oh, and then meats. Protein doesn't affect your sugar either. So if they want to have lean chicken, lean fish, beef, pork, that kind of stuff, those kind of things do not affect your sugar. If we really want to get into it to where they really control their diabetes and do carb counting, 
they've got another carbs, and then we will figure out how much of the rapid acting insulin do they need for each serving of carbohydrates. So if they want to have an omelet one morning with you know uh, egg whites and, and ham and spinach and bacon and well, not bacon, spinach and mushrooms and onions, they might not need to take any Novolog because there's no carbohydrate in that. But if they're going to have two pieces of toast, they might need six, eight, ten. It all depends on whatever their insulin to carb ratio is. And that's something that they need to kind of figure out. And we can help them do that. But again, it's very difficult. And I know this is the standard of what you do. You put people on a set dose of insulin. You always take 15 units before every meal. The problem with that is, is that if you vary your carbohydrate intake, then you're going to have problems. If you always, always need the same 45 grams of carbs, then that might work. But again, my body doesn't squirt out the same amount of insulin for a Mexican plate number one as it does for a Caesar salad. Mm -hmm. that's right. So it's all different. And so again, that's something I try to impress upon them is that they need to take some control over this and decide, again, empower them to know what the carbs are and how much into the, do they need for that amount of carbs. Okay. Now, moving on to the medication. Does anybody have any questions about the dietary part? Yes, ma'am. So when you were mentioning the whole wheat bread, uh -huh. I think, I mean, I guess for me when I'm recommending whole grains, it's not because I don't think they have carbohydrates in them, it's because the fiber it is healthier. is yes. better. Carbohydrates, yes. so them. whole so, grain breads are yeah. better. So I'm going to opt for brown rice but, over white but rice. But somehow food. they think it's good for you and I should eat all I can. Yeah. Right, but that's yes. where you talk about portion exactly. control. Exactly. Because if, to tell yes. someone they can not have rice at all so, anymore is not super bad. So I don't you think still have to talk about portion control, I totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. But somehow they get the message. They've gotten the message. Somebody told them, don't eat anything white. And so white bread's not good, but brown bread, you can have all you want. It's good for you. And that's the term they use. It's good for you. So they think the more you eat, the better. So they, they, so they, yeah, so there is. I think that's an American thing. Huh? I said, you think that's an American thing. We think it's. Well, I think just better. eating too much, period, is an American thing. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we had some relatives come from Germany a couple of weeks ago, and they stayed for two weeks. My sister lost four pounds taking them around. She says, they don't eat. They never ate. For breakfast, every morning she goes, I cook pancakes and syrup and, mush and, and eggs and sausages. They had a cup of coffee. So she says, I felt uncomfortable eating all that food in front of them, so I had a cup of coffee. <laughs> then for lunch, they went and had salad. And she goes, well, I guess I'm not getting the. Chicken fried steak today, I'll have a salad. And so she lost like four pounds just hanging out with them. <laughs> okay. When you talk about medications, when you said take your meds in the morning, this means between 7 and noon. So then, and a lot of these guys don't get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. They don't get up till 9, 10, 11 o'clock. If you ever made appointments, they, they said, don't you have, when I saw classes at 8, don't you have anything later? I don't get up until 11. I said, hey, you set your alarm just one night. You're retired. What else do you have to do? Just come in one day at 1 o'clock. Just be aware that you might want to check with them about when they're actually taking their meds. Um, many meds are taken improperly. Many medications have the specific timing, like the secreted dogs, like your lip and stuff. They have to be taken before the meal. They don't work if you take them after the meal. Once the sugar goes up, that they can't get the pancreas revved up enough to dump out enough insulin to accommodate for it then. So they have to be taken at least 20 to 30 minutes before the meal. And again, sometimes they take it 8 and 8. They, they don't understand it. So just make sure that when you're talking to them, especially if they're on glipizide, they're taking it about 20 to 30 minutes before they eat. Um, metformin, typically people think about it. We talk about this a lot. Typically 1,000 twice a day. When you put them on those 850 three times a day things, they, they always miss the noon time one. Because most of these guys are not at home. They go out and they don't take it with them. And so you really, you're actually getting less insulin. And I think Dr. Um, DeFranzo is the one that says 2,000 is like your, your most effective dose anyway. So just put them on BID with that. Um, on the label it says take with meals. There is nothing that makes it work better if you take it with a meal. When you first start taking it, it doesn't upset your stomach as badly. So it doesn't make it work better if you take it with a meal. So when you're talking to the patients, again, and they think they have to take it with meals, they forget the day is too late they want to take it. So metformin, you can swallow it down any time you want. When you first start, if they take it, I usually tell them, regardless of what the dose is, take one pill with supper. Because if they get diarrhea from this, they will never take it again. If you take metformin one morning and get to work and have massive explosive diarrhea, you ain't doing that again. And so just be, just be aware, they can take it with supper. I usually tell them to take it like on Friday, Saturday night, take a few bites of food, then swallow it down. Do that for three or four days. If everything goes well, then bump it back up to the, you know, the full dose. If, it, if you still feel queasy, then you can go for a few more days. Um, make sure they know about the possible GI problems, because if they do get the diarrhea, like I said, they'll never do it again. So just kind of, you know, especially like I said, they're at work. 
And so um, just kind of warn them and let them know that might happen. Uh, also, there's a, there's a bad urban legend, I guess you call it, about metformin and wings of kidneys. That's totally untrue. Metformin is not metabolized in any organ of the body, but it's excreted through the kidneys. So you have to have good kidney function to get rid of it. That's why we check creatinins and the SMA-GFR thing and stuff. So again, if, um, so I've, I've heard other health professionals tell patients, oh, thank goodness the metformin hasn't ruined your kidneys. That's not the situation, so just be aware of that. Diuretics, I see this a lot too. Patients, again, will complain about not being able to sleep at night because they haven't got to urinate. Now, one of the things that Dr. Musia talked about was the, the microvascular, com or the long-term complications. A very quick complication that you can fix is the, the nighttime having to pee. And now, if they're getting up three, four, five times a night, and when I mention this to them, they can always tell you exactly what hours they got up every night. And you know, they're supposed to be wearing their CPAP for four hours. They don't sleep for four hours at a time because they're up peeing all night, especially if they had just a little bowl of Cheerios before they went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> or just a couple of bananas, or, or they, I don't know, they walked to the mailbox and had to drink a thing of Gatorade you know, to make sure they had all their electrolytes replaced or something. So again, um, so that's another thing to gain their blood sugar is better. They actually get a better night's sleep. And people can make better decisions than when they have a good night's sleep. So the same thing with diuretics, though. A lot of times patients will take their Lasix at 6 or 8 and 8 or whatever time they think. They think it has to be 12 hours. The reason it's named Lasix is because it lasts 6 hours. If anybody's in here for the renal department, what you suggest you take it first thing in the morning and then about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The same thing with your hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothalidone, and Lasix. Those should be taken first thing in the morning and then early afternoon. If you take it once a day, of course, just first thing in the morning. But that second dose should be early afternoon. Um, insulin. Okay, that's another huge knowledge thing. People get associate insulin with, with complications. That when my grandma started on insulin, that's when she lost her legs, or that's when she went blind. Well, yeah, especially with that whole that clinical inertia thing that um, Dr. Blodgett, um, I guess, right? Yeah, Blodgett talked about. That is right because people keep putting it off and putting it off. Now, in some cases, it's like, oh my God, they haven't seen the doctor in a year. Well, I followed some patients, and you know, they they were seen in January. They're supposed to make an appointment three months later. They made it from March. It flooded, their car died, whatever happened. So it's another three months. Then the doctor cancels on, so it's another three months. So again, it might be a good nine to 12 months before they get back because we don't have a whole lot of availability sometimes, especially with certain doctors. So again, um, that's one of the things that, I do see some clinical nurse on that point. Now, when asked, if you ask the patient, do you take your insulin? The majority said, yeah, sure. I always say, I take my insulin. But when you look at the, the chart then on their CPRS record, and they haven't refilled in since last January or last March, I mean like March a year ago. I said, so how do you take it? We haven't filled it in over a year. <laughs> well, I might not take it every day. But so when you get down to it, they, they don't take it every day. Or they'll tell you if they take it every day, then they end up with low sugars. They only take it every other day. So, so you, take, you, you skip a day, let your sugar go up, then you take it so your sugar goes down, then you don't take it so your sugars go up. And so, um, anyway, so I have to kind of work that through. Um, if they have a low sugar, they will stop it because they know that's what causes it and people don't like having low blood sugars. Uh, make sure they keep it readily accessible. I think Dr. Blodgett mentioned insulin's good up to 86 degrees. People should not be storing their Lantus, their Dedimer, or their NPH in the, in the refrigerator. They should keep it by their bed because during the summer, whenever, they're sitting there watching TV, they watch the late movie, they're half asleep, they turn the TV off and they go, darn, I forgot my insulin. I'll take it tomorrow. They're not going to get up and walk all the way across the house to get it. So those insulins are, are fine at room temperature. So just keep it by, uh, either by the bed, or I tell them put it by your toothbrush. Denimir, NPH, Lantus, all those. When you get up, you take it, brush your teeth, wash your face, take your insulin, when you go to bed, if you're on twice a day. So again, just keep it, keep it handy. Um, a couple of patients have told me, and I'll show them a second while, they only need their insulin when their blood sugar is high. And I asked them one time, I said, why do you think, who told you that? Well, we're in the, when they were in the hospital, the nurses would come in and check their sugar, they go, oh, your blood sugar is normal. You don't need insulin today. Hmm. Okay. So that's what they're going off of. And so I spend a lot of time convincing them, you take insulin to keep your sugar normal, not to get it normal. If you're keeping it normal, then you don't have to take so much. But what they do is they skip a couple of days and they have to take this huge dose. And God forbid they should skip it on the day before they come in to get their blood sugar checked. Because now their blood sugar is 300, but I goes, oh, do you take 50 units? Yes, I do. Well, your blood sugar is 300. Obviously that's not, let's give you 70 units now. And so that's what ends up happening a lot of times. So we're not getting a whole clear picture on from these people. And then they don't understand the timing of it, each and some. Being these are military guys, as Dr. Blodgett mentioned, you also have those little peaks and stuff. You've got your Novolog or your, your rapid acting insulin. That's your little sniper bullet. When you take that one, it kicks in, takes care of your blood sugar right there and there. 
You have NPH, which is a kind of a longer range missile. You have your Dedimir, which is a little longer. And then Lantis is like machine gun fire. It sprays Ensign all day long, keeping all the blisters down. But the same way in military terms, when these guys went out in the field, they always had their gunner with them. You don't leave home without your gunner. So you make sure you always take your Lantis, your, your Dedimir. When you know that, and not that NPH is the, I mean, the um, carbs are the enemy, but when you know you're encountering the, the enemy you need, your sniper, that's when you take it, when you're going to be, you know, dealing with your carbohydrates. So that's kind of, a, and then also because they have specific timings on them, again, some of these guys take their insulin at 8 in the morning, sometimes 10, sometimes 12, the NPH, there's very specific timings on NPH. It doesn't kick in for three or four hours. Sometimes they have the idea that, well, whenever you take NPH, you have to eat. It's not going to kick in for three or four hours. What difference does it make? So they hold it until they know they're going to eat. And so if, they, if they're you know, like messing around in the morning time and don't get around, they might not take their NPH until 10 or 11 o'clock that morning, which then pushes the peak off until it's 5 or 6 that afternoon, which is what time another one kicks in. So again, they just need to be aware of They need to pick some time. And, uh, and if it's not working for them, you let the doctor know. And that's why I tell them it's important. You let us know when you're having problems because if, again, going back to the military analogies, my son's in the Marine Corps. Uh, one of the first things they learn is know your enemy, know where he is. That's why they should be checking their sugars. If they can call in those coordinates to me and tell me where the problem is, I can send help. But the same way when they come and they don't bring their books back, that's like going to H&R Block with having receipts. There's nothing the doctor can do. And they say, well, I go to the doctor and they don't do anything to help me. Well, because you're not prepared. The H&R Block guy, how many times has he filled out your, your tax forms without your receipts? You've got to have that stuff with you. And so again, they need to make sure that they understand that those numbers are something important. Um, this we had talked about already about the different insulin actions. If anybody's interested, I have this. I can get you a copy if you're going to do some patient teaching or something, just so you can show them how the different where the different insulins work and stuff, so they can kind of get a feel. Or I'd like to just draw it out. What time do you normally get up in the morning? What time do you take your insulin? Just show them. Okay, this insulin is peaking during this time period. You eat during that time period? Oh no, I don't get around to eating until five or six hours later. Well, that might be a problem because your insulin's going to kick in regardless of whether you want to eat or not. So you kind of have to match it up. Okay, this is a little long. This is a, a patient that I saw. He actually stopped me in the hallway, and this is what I was talking about. Um, he was saying, look at this, look at my blisters, look how crazy they are. I said, oh look, that's interesting. Monday morning your blisters went on one, so what'd you do? He goes, well I didn't take my insulin because I didn't need it because my sugars are normal. So the next day your blisters 213, what do you do about that? He goes, well, I take my insulin because I need it, my sugars are high. So the next day your blood sugar is 114, why well, don't take it? Then your sugar goes up to 246. By this time he's saying, oh, you think I should take it every day? I said, yeah, it's probably a good idea. He says, you're not taking it because it's high, you take it to keep it normal. Because again, the insulin that you take here then is working back over here. So you're always, you're always kind of, uh, it's, it's hard to train these men to be proactive instead of reactive. Don't wait for your sugars to get high. Take the insulin that you need to take to keep your sugars normal. Okay. Here's another one. So we're going over this. I know, so look, that's not bad. Oh, yeah, sugars are really good there. Gee, look, Thursday morning, your sugar's kind of high. So we go on the other Thursday. So what is it you do on Wednesday nights to, to make that go up like that? Well, that's the night he takes his mother out to dinner. I said, so where do y'all go? Well, some restaurant, but where? And what do you get? Chicken salad. I thought, that sounds good. And a, diet, and a Sprite. I said, a regular Sprite? He goes, well, yeah. I said, we've talked about that. He goes, oh, no, no. My doctor told me clear sodas have no calories. <laughs> and I said, you must have misunderstood. He probably said clear sodas have no caffeine. He goes, no, no. He said the clear soda had no calories. I said, you know, there's new literature about that. They must not have read that. I will send that to them right away. You cannot drink regular sodas. I don't care what color they are. He gets them in the blood sugar. And again, for those patients who don't like Diet sodas, they can drink water. Sure. But there's, yeah, they have to drink water, use crystal light or whatever kind of thing. But again, just look on the cat, just flip it all over and look at the back to see about the carbs. Now, numeracy problems. I found a lot of people cannot add and subtract well. The number one illiteracy in the United States is numeracy. If you know how many people go bankrupt, that's why. They have no clue about numbers. So again, it makes it very difficult for patients to, like, we, back, I don't see this as much anymore, where they had to mix two insulins together in the same syringe, you know, put the air in the cloudy, air in the clear, draw the clear, draw the cloudy. They have a real problem with that. We don't do that much anymore, and typically they do it separate. If a patient can't figure out how to do that, they do not have to mix it together. They can do it separate. It's fine. And in fact, I usually tell them if they're on Lantus and Novolog, the Lantus needs to be in the bathroom, and the Novolog needs to be in the kitchen, where they eat. 
And that way they have less of a chance to mix them up too. Uh, sometimes it's easier just to tell them to increase by two units every two days or so until you get your blood sugar to a certain level. And again, the other thing, make sure the patients know the goal. When we start class, I always ask them, so what does your doctor told you your, your blood sugar should be? Everybody just sits there. Your doctor hasn't told you anything about what it should be, and some guy will say, 300. Your doctor told you your sugar should be 300. And he goes, well, no, but it was 400, so I'm thinking 300's better, right? <laughs> so when I tell people that my goal is to get their sugars down to 100 to 120, they start laughing at me. Because they said, it's never been that way in the last 30 years. I said, well, it's going to be now, because you, you're here. We're going to fix it. But again, they, again, because they have no clue what making that happen, they can't fix it. If you don't know what the cause is, you can't, you know, isn't that one of the 12 step programs first identify the problem? Yeah. You have to identify the problem. So again, you know, to help them with getting that, the right dose of insulin for them. Um, hearing problems. A lot of our men, especially the older veterans, cannot hear properly. Make sure you write this down. Um, I think I have some hearing loss in one of my ears. Which ear, ear is it? 2013. <laughs> so, again, you know, and that's why it's kind of hard when you walk in and call their name and they just go, uh huh. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to be rude, but those of you who have elderly husbands, they do that all the time, right? You ask them something, they just smile and nod because they figure it's easier that way. <laughs> so you have to be able you know, ask them specifically questions or write it down for them, have information for them so they don't get home and get confused that when you said 13, they didn't think 30 or vice versa or whatever. Visual impairments. A lot of times patients will have problems with reading the syringe. And when I show them how, you know, okay, draw it up for me, they just kind of, <laughs> they can't see it. One of the things to keep in mind is that on the syringes, the one cc syringes are marked off in twos. So if you order 15 units of insulin, there's no way they're going to take 15. There's not a mark for it. They're just guesstimating. So they're getting 14 or 16, so you might as well order that. It'll make it a lot easier. But again, if, you, if they're on less than 30, it's like 40, if they're on 40 units or less, order them a smaller syringe. And that way they can actually see the little lines. Um, if, if you have a patient who's having problems, observe them. Hand them, you know, you can get the little uh, saline things from the pharmacy. Have them, you know, have a patient drop and show you how they do it. Because a lot of them have, they just kind of guess. Um, they guess. Oh, another man was telling me not too long ago, he said, you know, that insulin, I said, well, you haven't filled your insulin a long time. Do you need more? He goes, oh, no, that stuff lasts forever. I said, really? And so I said, well, show me what you're doing. So um, we brought in, the insulin was way down here, and the, the top of the needle was up above it. Oh, my God. So he was drawing air all the time. Oh well, because God. clear insulin, he didn't realize there was no insulin in the syringe. So he's giving himself 20 units of air shots like for the last four months. And I said, okay, well, let's talk about this. Every single ball holds a thousand units of air and or insulin. If they're taking 20 units a day, that'll be 50 days. If they're taking 50 units a day, it's going to be 20 units. So kind of give them some idea of how long these vials should last. Okay. Just so they'll kind of have a little more information on what to do. Um, for mixing techniques, like I said, I haven't seen anybody in a long time. But if they are having some problems, have them bring it in. Because sometimes if their, their Novolog or their clear one gets all cloudy, it's not going to work. And I have seen them just, oh, just recently the guy was showing me how he would draw up the NPH and then he would inject it, the whole thing into this one. They draw back on the dose again. And so I said, how do you know what you're taking? Well, that's what they taught me to do. Now, I'm sure no one did that. But that was his impression of what he was taught to do. So again, you might want to take a look at their Nova log or their, uh, if it's getting, uh, they're not getting the oomph they should be. Okay, one other thing I want to mention about this, when they're getting insulin, Dr. Blodgett mentioned this this morning, when you give insulin, the best absorption rate is in the belly, in the, in the, in the abdomen. Second best is the arms, last is thighs. That doesn't mean you can't give it there, but you're gonna, they're going to have a different absorption rate. I read an article one time, and it's been a little while, that said you get about 87% absorption from your belly, 68 from the arms, and it drops down to 36 in the thigh. For those patients who just don't want to give it in their belly, then they can give it in their leg, but they're going to have to take a different dose. And again, they're going to have to they'll know how much to take based on what their blood sugars are. So this is, a, there's no magic formula, and I know they show, you know, 0.7 to 1 per kilo, 50-50, the whole thing, and then you just kind of start moving it around from there. So again, make sure that they know what, you know, where, what their blood sugars are and where those insulins are working so they can get a, a, a good dose. Um, so when that, with the old thing was give it two inches away from the belly button, that doesn't mean a two inch circle around your belly button, that means two inches away from your belly button. So I usually tell them wherever they can pinch an inch, they can get us all around in here. <laughs> this man the other day, when I said pinch an inch, he goes, oh honey, you can yank a yard on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes sir, we're going to work on that. 
anyway, so again, just kind of observe them, have some spare, no, uh, some spare uh, saline and stuff, let them kind of look at it and help them to do it. Um, also, it's interesting that, you know, sometimes in the hospital, we give them insulin, give them insulin, and then when they're ready to leave, I say, well, we'll hear, you know, about doing this at home. They go, oh, I'm not doing this at home. <laughs> and you are. <laughs> so feel free to give us a call, you know, send them to class. I have some flyers up here if you want to take some flyers with you. Uh, but just get whoever can, because again, they're just, they're clueless, just clueless, bless their hearts. Now, this is something, hopefully you can read this. This is something new I try, because one of the first thing I do is I look at the chart. Because when they tell me they're doing these things. So let's see, here's their Dedimir. It was last filled August. Did I say August? Let's see. I can't well. I'm sorry, I tried to do something new. But I want y'all to see some of the things to look at here. Yeah, April. Well that's not bad. So Dedimir, April, that's okay. And then the syringes. Look at the syringes. Syringes, September of last year. So how do they take insulin if they haven't had syringes in nine months? And it's not like they had a whole lot. But they had 300, but still. So I asked them, so, like, so where do you get your supplies from? Well, from you. Well, since I haven't given you in syringes in, in nine months, how do you take your insulin every day? Oh, well, I might not take it every day. So see, little things like that you kind of start picking up on. I think that's the only one of that. So that was the first thing on that one. Oops, sorry. Now, here's another one. Um, a meter, that's another thing. Always check to make sure they have a meter. You don't know how many patients I see who come to me and I say, so where's your logbook? I don't have one. Well, how do you check your blood sugars? I don't check my blood sugars. So how do they know that they're giving you more and more insulin every day? So they go strictly off the A1C. And I've seen it, A1C elevated. You know, you can have an A1C of seven with a blood sugar of 130 all the time, are gonna be 30 and 300. That all averages out the same. So again, make sure everybody has a meter, they have their supplies and stuff. Um, next one is glipizide. Oh look, all the diabetes medicines are expired. <laughs> glipizide expired back in December of last year. Their test strips expired back in November of last year. Their metformin expired last year. So it's no wonder his blood sugar is able to see is 10. Right. So just kind of talk to him about that, find out. Now sometimes they've been gone. Sometimes patients, you know, go on these lengthy trips or something wherever they go. But again, I don't, somehow they just don't get the idea that they need to take these pills. They don't work unless they take them. So that's, that's one that I want you to look at. Here's another one. Again, he has his meter. He has his insulin. It's been refilled in um, April of this year. What was this? One? Syringes are pretty good. Novolog. Oh, it's Novolog. Novolog's not been filled since October of last year. Obviously, he's going to take Novolog before his meals. Now, another thing you can ask is, how often do you eat away from home? Because people do not cook. People do not cook. They all eat out. And if they're going to eat out, they have to take their Novolog with them to take it before they eat, unless they're not going to eat any carbs. Now, we do that in class again. When they're sitting there, and I'm checking their sugars, and every once in a while, and people don't check very often, when I check them, they say, oh, look, your blood sugar is 120 before lunch. It's never, can't be, mm -mm, can't be, it's never 120 before lunch. I said, so when was the last time you checked it? Mm, I don't, how do you yeah. know that? <laughs> or when I hand out meters and they don't know how to put the little needle in the, the lancet and the lancing device, obviously they don't check their sugar, but they don't know how to put the lancet together. So that's my assessment of it. So um, anyway, so this guy, apparently he's not taking it, obviously not taking his Novolog, he hadn't filmed it for a while. So you just get the little talks about that. Now that is one of the criteria for getting Novolog in a pen is that when they eat away from home, and that way they can carry the pen with them. Okay. Here's one, Lipizide. Right at the top is glucose tablets. Now, why would this person have glucose tablets? Because they had hypoglycemic. They've been having low blood sugars. Now, if they're having sugars frequently enough to where they order uh, tablets for them, something's wrong again. I think that, again, maybe they don't know, maybe they're taking, are they on? And it's just from glipizide. Now, the other thing that I've come across recently is that, do you know PTSD feels a whole lot like a little blood sugar? I've had several patients have PTSD reactions in class, and they got they said, oh, I got, I got to get something. Yeah, I just feel really bad. I check, said, so let's check your sugar. It's 189. Hmm, not your blood sugar. And so they said, well, this happens every day at 3 o'clock or whatever time it is. And so they always go and get a soda. 
So just be aware of that too. So make sure you get them to check their sugars just to verify it, because there's a lot of different things that can happen. You know, to, to might feel like a low blood sugar, it's not. Especially if all the, if their A1C is always eight, nine, or ten, they're not having a lot of low blood sugars. It's does kind of work that way. Okay. Let's see. Anything else on this one? Oh, here's one. Remember, Doctor uh, uh, Cope said something about triglycerides. One of the things, a lot of times I ask patients, the first thing is when they ask about, like, what do you drink with your meals, and if they're always drinking water, if you pull up their triglycerides, you can make this little worksheet and show them these numbers. Gee, look at this, triglycerides, 415. That usually indicates to me that you're drinking too much soda, fruit juice, Gatorade, Pan Dulce maybe. Oh, well, yeah, I might have a few. So, again, that's a good way to cap. Now, sometimes I'll say, well, it, drinking... You're, drinking carbs doesn't raise your triglycerides, but you can sure catch them on this. And I don't care, I don't say this. A girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do to get to the right information. <laughs> and I wanna know what they're really doing. And so if I can get them to fess up that they are drinking sodas or Gatorade or, or pre-sweetened lemonades or whatever the case might be, you know, then we can start working on that and figure out what the problem is. Now, this guy, he started out with an A1C of 6.6 .6 at the beginning of the year. And often sets up to 13.5, four months later. He got to talking. You know what happened? He got a juicer for Christmas. <laughs> so now, you know, it's good to eat lots of juice, lots of fruit. So he's throwing in an apple, an orange, a banana, a couple of handfuls of strawberries. Um, and so we had to kind of talk about that too. Because in, in that, that's all it was. And so it took a little while to come back down again. Add vegetables. Yes, yes, yes. Add more vegetables and said just all the juice. Yes. Now, we're seeing glucose values. Here we went from 8.1 to 11.1, 14, 15.6. Again, just to talk about it, because that's not a real big time frame. To talk about what was going on, maybe, um, I think in this case, this general was having some family problems, and he just didn't want to take the insulin anymore. Just didn't want to take it. But again, he had no clue what was doing to him, and he's not checking his sugars at home either. So some of those things you can kind of start talking to them about, you know, what, and a lot of times you've asked them, so why is your sugar so high? They'll tell you what it is. They know. They just don't know how to fix it. Okay, self-monitoring. It's very important that patients monitor their blood sugars. Again, you gotta know, know your enemy, know where he is. They gotta know where, they gotta know where the problems are. Um, so, and then they say no one ever looks at, so they just quit ringing them. So yeah, make it a point to look at them and ask them, so why was it high here? Why do you think it was low here? And a lot of times they'll know why that is. Uh, poor understanding how to interpret them, what makes those values. Again, was it because they ate a whole bunch of sugar-free cookies? That's not going to affect their sugar, so they can't, they can't make that connection. That's why the sugar is 300. Um, also, I asked them if they could please write down why they think it was that high. Because when, I, when they come back in a month later, I said, so why was your high sugar so high back on June 3rd? They're not going to remember. So make a little notes of themselves while, you know, in the chart, in the uh, log book, so they can kind of uh, give you some heads up. A um, couple of case, my case studies. Then you can't judge, judge a book by its cover. We had a young man, 45 years old, came out with this long, stringy, unwashed hair. Um, he, was a, he had a BKA, had these old, filthy tennis shoes on it, dirty, baggy shorts, uh, a pendulous abdomen hanging out underneath his shirt. You know, um, so he came to class, and I was supposed to start my insulin. So I'm thinking, I was the PA, I was going to tell him, thank you so much. What am I supposed to do? You know, you know. So I got to talk to him to that, and he said he just didn't want to start, so I made an agreement with him. If he could cut down his carbs, and start exercising more. I said you might not need insulin. That whole thing about once you're on insulin, you're not always, always always you're not necessarily always on insulin. Insulin could be something just to kind of get you over the hump. But if you're taking insulin because you're drinking sodas and and his big thing was uh, a couple of cokes and crown every afternoon. So we had a little discussion about switching to diet soda, and so he did that. And so four weeks later, he called and he did up the sodas and rum. He was doing crunches daily. Now my first thought was, that must be something, to watch him doing crunches. I don't know how he got on the floor, got off the floor, but he said he's doing crunches, good with me. He already lost 15 pounds, and he was very excited. His sugars were all between 80 and 120. So um, we decided, well, good, you don't need the insulin. I'll call the doctor, I'll put a note in the chart, we'll tell the doctor, you fixed it. You got rid of whatever was causing those high sugars, and you're, you're correcting this. Now keep checking them, and I'm not gonna put in the chart that you're not taking the insulin, because then you won't get any strips so we'll just continue on with that. You keep checking your shirts, and as long as you keep them below 120, we're good. Well, then a couple weeks later, he called back and said, do I have to take my insulin? So I said, so what are your sugars? Again, 80, 90, 110, 102, 87. And so apparently the home health nurse had come by, 
and yelled at him and said, you have diabetes and you have to take insulin. Oh my God. I said, I am so sorry, but apparently, she, did you show her your numbers? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, well, then what do you think? He goes, I don't need insulin. I said, fine with me. As long as you don't take insulin because you have diabetes. You take insulin because your blood sugars are high. If you can control it in some other fashion, more power to you. I think that's wonderful. And again, that's part of the whole empowering the patient thing. Yeah. Nothing makes some decisions. It's kind of like when the speed limit says 70. If it's raining, you can't drive 70. You better slow down or speed up, whatever. So again, use those numbers as kind of a baseline. But again, as long as you have some justification for it and know why you're making those changes, I think the doctor's going to be okay with that. Patient number two, this guy was always very well dressed. He came in a little business suit. He had clinical appointments every six weeks. His sugar was always so high, it was always over 9%. Never bought a log book. He was telling me he goes out to eat almost every night because his wife works. And they went out places like uh, Outback and Olive Garden. And I said, I'll go out to eat with you. Anyway, he, he was uh, unable to work out. He had such a hectic schedule. So I finally asked him, and I said, so obviously, you know, what do you do? He goes, well, he's a, a teacher. I said, where do you teach? He goes, UTSA. What do you teach? Math. Hmm. So I said, math. All this is is a numbers game. All you got to do is manipulate the numbers of your carbs and your insulin to make it come out to the number you want. And I don't know why, but he had never put that together. I never saw him again. When I check him out once in a while, his blood sugars are all fine. He's like 66.2. Okay, here's one more thing. Now, one of the things we talk about is with weight loss. Out of these items, a stick of butter, Denny's Meat Lover breakfast, 20 chicken wings with ranch dressing, Cheesecake Factory meatloaf, Dairy Queen four strip chicken basket, or a foot long meatball marinara. Which do you think has the most calories? The worst calories. Or the least calories, that's right, the least amount of calories. Stick of butter, stick of butter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So look at that, a stick of butter has 815 calories. Denny's Meat Lover breakfast, 1230. 20 chicken wings, 2,000 calories. Yeah. You know how many people chow down on those and will take in a 30 wings at a time with a couple of beers? Cheesecake meat, uh, meatloaf, 19, almost 2,000 calories. The Dairy Queen four strip basket that they advertise for $4.99 on TV, 1,394 with 96 grams of fat. And a football, foot, football, <laughs> football, <laughs> meatball marinara, 720 calories. So yeah, just so patients are aware of that. In summary, when you're talking to the patients, ask open-ended questions. Ask them for information. Try to get as much as you can from them. Listen to what they're actually saying. Sometimes there's little words that give you some hints as to what they're trying to get across. Include them in the decision making. If you put them on inside and they don't ever plan to do that, then making a difference. You can teach them. They're not going to do it. Uh, empower them. Again, engage them and empower them. Let them have some say so in this so they can practice with it. Make sure they come to diabetes education. If you have time to do this, that's great. I really think they do well in the classroom type of setting because they're with others of their like kind. And they all start sharing. You know, you're not supposed to share information. They tell everybody everything. So uh, but that's their thing. And then uh, refer to behavioral health if needed. Yeah, if they're having some real problems with it. So in summary, again, inform your patients, inspire your patients, enthuse your patients, empower your patients, engage your patients. Whatever you think we can do, again, to help them to start making some changes and realize how, they, how, their, how their decisions are affecting their life. This is a little slide of Dr. DeFranzo's. If you ever want to get more information, go up, just Google the Omnis Octet and talks about all these different body organs and the different medicines and how they work. So Ralph DeFranzo and the Omnis Octet. This is a little thing we did before. And, oh, for the person who asked about the SGLTs, this is where the glucose, 90% of the glucose is reabsorbed, so the SGLT blocks that, so you just pee it out. That's it. Good. Any questions? Yes, sir. Recently I read an article in the paper with a uh, scientific journal that artificial sweeteners might elevate the A1C. I don't, you know, if you talk to the, there's nothing in that's going to do that. There's a lot of stuff that comes across with that, but again, uh, in it, when we do it, check it yourself. Have a, have a diet soda, check your sugar before, have a diet soda, check your sugar after and see if it goes up. I was in a, in a meeting one time with physicians. One of the physicians said, oh, those artificial, those artificial sodas, they make my sugar go up. I said, so what was your sugar beforehand? He never checked before. So just because he drank it and checked and that's 250, he assumes it was from that. But he didn't know it was 250 beforehand. You know? So the best thing you do is check your sugar, because that way you'll know for sure. And if you, in your case, if you can drink a diet soda, your sugar goes up 100 points, and I wouldn't do that, but I don't think it's going to happen. There's nothing in it that's going to make it go up. Anything else? How, how, exactly. often have you heard, how often have you heard the statement, I, uh, you mean I have to eat grass? Oh, yeah. 
I'm going to be a rabbit or something. That's why I try to tell them also he needs, and they can have the, the things, but it's three handfuls about. That's good for men to be able to figure it out. All right. That was Alrighty. Uh, Barbara Wall, thank you very much for that. And her props, too. If you have any questions, I'm right across from the, from the rec room. I'm in the park. Motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine.